live on YouTube. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Quinn Jacobson. Welcome to the Studio Q Show. We're going to talk about all things wet collodion today. Specifically, we're going to talk about chemistry, storage, handling, all those really important things. I know it's not a um, completely fascinating topic for people, but it's definitely important. And uh, we'll see if we can... Um, get you uh, get you a little bit of information. I'm going to show you how I go through. This isn't just me making things up uh, about the chemicals we use in the process. This is more about science and data and evidence. And I, again, I want to try to convey those tools to you so you can do your own research, find out what you're com comfortable with, your risk management, handling certain compounds or components, those kinds of things. And uh, we're trying to get you some tools today, <clears throat> or when you're watching this, that um, allows you to be confident about handling uh, the compounds and chemistry in the, this process, or these processes, I should say. Hello, Will. Good to see you, brother, from Erie, PA. And there's Zach. <laughs> hey, buddy. Good to see you, too. The build is going well. Um, I just installed uh, my propane tank yesterday. 500 gallon above ground propane tank. The lines run. It's hooked to the house. Really, the only thing we're waiting on now is for this rural electric company to get up here. I was going to go all solar, but we decided to go ahead and give it the juice. So we're waiting on them to tie us in, and we we will be moving in shortly after that. I hope. So anyway, good to see you, Zach. I hope you can get up here sometime. Uh, Jan from Norway, good to see you, brother man. And Renzo from Belgium, good, good. Everybody's in here. So if you want to learn a little bit about making sure that you're handling, using, storing, and uh, using, I guess, yeah, using these chemistry, these uh, these chemicals properly, it's uh, it's going to be a good show for you. I think you're going to get a lot out of this. Hello, Tom from Canada. I don't think we've seen you in here before. Welcome, welcome, and uh, Ketterman. Yes, Herr Ketterman, there you go. Um, let's throw Bogusly in here. Good to see you, brother. Um, uh, and Hank, Hank is in here, but he doesn't have any devices connected. So good to see everybody. Let's get going. We have a dozen people on YouTube and a few in here. That's enough for me to get excited about sharing some information. So we're going to... I'm not going to go over every chemical. I'm going to give you the tools. I'm going to show you some examples. I'm going to give you some resources so you can find out what you need to do. Uh, what you know, and there's there's a lot of different ways you can tackle this. Some people don't use additional ether. Some people don't use cadmium bromide. Some people don't use potassium cyanide. We're just going to talk about how you do research to find out what it is that I'm handling. How am I supposed to handle it? And how am I supposed to uh, store it? And how am I supposed to just have the, these products around? Now, there's a, there's a ton of places you can go uh, to get the material safety data sheets. That, that's what they used to be called, MSDS sheets. They're not, now just called safety data sheets. You can call them either one. They both go by the, the same name. Uh, basically, that's what they are. They're material data safety sheets. They're, they're, they give you the information on a particular product or compound you're looking at and tell you the severity or, or the, the potential hazards and what you need to watch out for but with handling and storing these compounds. So we're going to talk about that. Well, hello, Paul Smith. Good to see you. <laughs> and Posse. Yeah, we got quite a Posse here every week, which is really cool. I like it. There's a uh, Get a lot of good feedback on this, so I appreciate it. I know I'm not fancy and funny, and I don't have all the bells and whistles and all the cool music and the great video <laughs> post-production stuff. Just me and my old mug jabbering away. So um, I'm glad you guys, you're, you're really positive about this, and I appreciate it. But um, I do appreciate hearing that. And good afternoon, Linda. Good to see you from Sweden. Sweden. We love Sweden. I taught a workshop in Gothenburg. We taught up there. Um, I say up there because we came from Germany. We drove up to uh, the northern part of Germany, had all my stuff in a, in a Toyota 4Runner. We pulled up on a ship and we sailed 
to the fjords in Denmark up to Sweden and drove the truck off and went over and taught the workshop in an old school there in Gothenburg. Really cool. Scandinavian countries are awesome. I love the Scandinavian countries. They're great. Good morning, Mark Zimmerman. That's good to see you in here too, brother. So let's start by saying, where do I go to get these resources on these chemicals I'm, I'm using? I read on Facebook, this guy says this and that person says that and this lady says this. How do I know what I'm dealing with? Should I really use these compounds? How do I, uh, really what we're talking about is how do I assess my risk management? That's what we say in English, this kind of risk management means that this is how my, how far I'm willing to go or what compounds I'm willing to use in, in with the idea of mitigating these safety and, and, and dangerous issues. And, and there are many, explosion, poisoning, uh, there, there's all kinds of stuff that can go wrong here. And we surely don't want to have a big wet blanket thrown over this process um, by somebody hurting or killing themselves. You guys have heard me rant a lot about some of the practices. Um, and again, I think I've said this before, but just because it's in a 19th century manual doesn't mean that it's applicable today. Not always, right? So when you read about people heating up or boiling their silver bath, and then you see people posting videos on YouTube about how to heat and boil your silver bath. I'm going to show you a couple of things today. Silver fulminate can be formed by heating or boiling silver bath. You have all the right components, 80 degrees Celsius. And if you don't know what silver fulminate is, we'll, we'll do an SDS sheet on it and see, see what you think. I just, there are, my risk management stops at creating volatile compounds with interactions of these chemicals and heat and all kinds of things. You can create bombs or explosives really easy with this stuff uh, if you're not careful. You can also create huge fire hazards. Um, we know that ether and, and collodion, nitrocellulose, highly explosive, um, and just the off-gassing of some of these, just the ventilation problems. So we're going to talk about all that. Hey, La Foto Galleria, good morning. Buenos dias. Good morning. Good morning. Happy morning to you as well. I'm very happy because yesterday I bought the Chemical Pictures book. Yay, good for you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And again, I always thank you guys for doing that. That's how I get my love back for doing this. And I'm happy to do it. But it's just really nice to have you guys supporting me. So let's jump right in here and do this. Let's share this screen. Um, I use a variety of sources. So don't, uh, don't take this as absolute uh, gospel or absolute truth here. Um, or, or only one resource. This is the uh, safety data uh, sheets search. It's uh, chemistry, chemicalsafety.com slash SDS hyphen search. I'm going to show you a couple of different ways. This again just refers to, um, I'll put that link in the chat here just so we have it. This re and you guys can jump in there and do your own kind of poking around. Um, this this is a great resource, and, I'll, and I'm going to show you why here in just a second. Um, I'm going to put it in the personal one too, or the private one. Killing worn C KCN soul and mixing fresh is not fun at all. <laughs> yeah, yes, you're right, Pablo. That's good. Pablo just neutralized some KCN, and uh, we kind of talked about that. We'll talk a little bit about some of those things as well too. So one of the reasons I like this particular um, SDS search or MSDS search, whatever you want to call it, is that it returns uh, multiple sources for you to select from. So <clears throat> while not all SDS sheets are created equal, um, they all contain the pertinent, pertinent information. And a lot of these companies like Sigma Aldrich and um, Argos, there's a ton of these chemical companies that kind of brand their own uh, safety data sheet. But all the information is the same. So don't freak out thinking, oh, I'm on this site and it doesn't give me the correct information. No, they're all legit. They all work fine. And so it's your choice. I'm just giving you, I'm just showing you this particular site because it's easy, user-friendly, it's free, and it gives you all of the the parameters that you need to to make sure you're getting the right stuff. So let's talk about the first problem. I want to come in here, and I want I want to know about pyrogalic acid, or I want to know about uh, potassium cyanide, 
a lot of times if you're new to this process, these words are extremely uh, difficult to, to retain in your head, if your mind, if you haven't used them a lot. So there are other compounds that are very similar, like ferrocyanide, not potassium cyanide, but ferrocyanide. So a lot of times when you're typing in the words, unless you have that information right in front of you and you know you're, you're typing in the correct name of the compound or chemical, uh, you might get results for a different compound. One of the, or chemical, one of the ways around this is to use the CAS number. Now, the CAS number is, is chemical abstract system or something like that. I can't remember. Maybe one of you guys can look in my book and tell me what it is. It's chemical abstract something. The bottom line is with that number, and I published all of these numbers in chapter four of my book. All the chem each one of the chemicals are lined out, and I give a little paragraph about what it's all about. They all have the CAS number. If you use that CAS number and it's universal, global, you will always get the correct uh, compound, return the correct information uh, with it for the compound you're looking for. So, well, I can come in here and say, we'll just type ferrous sulfate in here, ferrous sulfate, right? I can type that in. And what it does is it brings back the search results. And here are all the different manufacturers, like I was saying. Uh, Fisher has a lot in there, don't they? GFS. So there's a lot of different areas you can, or, uh, companies you can uh, select from. Science Lab is great. Any of them are great. Like I said, they're just not that important to uh, pick one and, and look, pick, pick a couple of them and look through them and see what you think. So here we go. And I open this up, and again, like I said, these are just brands up here. What's important is that you have the right CAS number, the right compound name, and then start looking at the chronic, uh, acute and chronic health effects. So a lot of times they're going to be ranked one through four. I'll show you a couple of those. But it goes through and it talks about eye contact, skin contact, and all of these are going to be the same, right? any way you come into contact with that chemical or compound, whether it's aerosol, inhalation, touching, uh, anything, skin contact, um, all, you know, all that stuff. Indig ingestion, I, I almost said indigestion. You would probably get indigestion if you, you ate some of these things, but um, ingestion, I, I really, I'm, I'm kind of baffled by this one all the time because I don't know what people are doing, but they, they have to put it in there. So I guess people, some people try to taste some of these things or something. I don't know. Then they go through a small spill, large spill, precautions, storage. Um, and, and they go down into some of the more detailed kind of the specs on all of it, right? Odor threshold. We'll look at some of these different ones just to give you an idea. Uh, toxicology. Um, tox toxicity to animals. LD50. And if you don't know what LD is, uh, LD is lethal dose, lethal dose. Um, and uh, and they say it's not available. Um, chronic effect on humans for animals anyway. Chronic effect on humans may cause damage to the falling order. So this is ferrous sulfate, guys. This is that sweet smelling stuff you put in your developer. I, we call it iron. But look at that. Kidneys, liver, cardiovascular system, central nervous system, other toxic effects on humans. Um, inter, um, hazardous in case of skin irritant, ingestion or inhalation. Um, they really, they're really big on toxicity to animals. And I, I can understand that as well, too. Um, may affect genetic material, mutagenic. That's, you know, just on ferrous sulfate. You, you start getting the idea now that, wait a minute, um, I thought this was just simple iron. I just thought it was, you know, basic... Uh, did I not have those up there? I guess I didn't. Sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I'm over here rambling. I don't even have this. Let me stop this. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I get going and I'm like, uh, let me let me stream. I'm looking at this sheet and you guys are saying, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> sorry. Here we go. Um, I think it's this one. Yeah, I think it is. Let's see. Yeah. So this is what I was looking at. Uh, so okay, let's go back up here to the top. Sorry about that. So th this is the SDS sheet. This is the safety data sheet or material safety data sheet on ferrous sulfate. This is the compound that we use in developer. Uh, fairly innocuous, pretty much, right? I mean, 
Uh, here you have the CAS number listed there. And if you go to my book, and you, it's alphabetical, chapter four. And if you go to my book and you look in uh, chapter four and scroll down to the uh, alphabetically, go down to F for ferrous sulfate. And let's see if we have the right uh, CAS number in there. Uh, let's go back here. I'm going to use this CAS number and see if we get anything different. So I'm going to chop that one down. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to chop that one down. And we're going to come back and uh, use this one. You know, look at that first one. Here, here's a great example. I didn't do this on purpose, but um, it's, it's a great example of what I'm talking about. When you come in here, make sure that you're looking at the proper compound. So remember, I clicked on this first ferrous sulfate from Science Lab. Look at the CAS number. And that's a different CAS number. This is the CAS number we want right here. So let's go in here. I think you guys are on board with me here. Yeah, you are. Let's go in here. Here's CAS 7782-63.0. That is correct. And it's really important to have these numbers because a lot of these compounds have slight variations on them, and they're they're off. Can you guys see that? Let's let's make sure because I don't want to lose you again here. Yeah, you uh, no, you can't see it. Damn. I have to switch every single time, okay? Because I'm drilling down on these safety data sheets and it loses it. There we go. So I'm into the safety data sheet now. You guys can see it. Good. Um, so here's the CAS number, the 7782-63. That's ferrous sulfate. Uh, this happens to be Sigma Aldrich, which is great. No problem. And then first aid measure. So again, they're, all these sheets are laid out somewhat differently. You can pick one company, and if they have all the compounds, get all the sheets with the, for the chemicals you use. And that way you'll get used to reading them. That way we can print them out, have a quick reference, or make a PDF or something so you have a quick reference. But each one of them are going to be a little different, but they're all going to say the same thing, right? Safety, handling, storage, contact, inhalation, all that stuff. So if, if inhaled, if breathed in, move a person to fresh air. If not, if not breathing, give artificial respiration. That's kind of interesting there, right? Um, never give anything by mouth to an unconscious person. That's funny. I, I hadn't read those before. Firefighting me, um, measures, um, not a big, not a big deal there. It's not really flammable. We're going to look at a couple that give numbers to these that make it really actually even more interesting because you can get a quick readout. So personal precautions, right? Um, accidental release uh, measures. Um, avoid dust formation. Avoid, avoid breathing vapors, Mr. Gas. No environmental precautions. No special environmental precautions required. So what we're talking here, we're just talking about a slightly modified iron, if you will. Um, so swept up, shovel up, keep suitable, closed containers for disposal. And you can see the disposal section. Handling and storage. There it is. Um, keep container tightly closed in a dry, well-ventilated place. Um, so you get the idea here, right? That's a pretty innocuous um, compound. Use equipment for eye protection, skin protection, body protection. So here we go. Odor, no data available. pH, that's another really nice thing about looking at these. We don't really ever talk about the actual pH of the chemicals or the compounds we're using in their raw form. And here we go. We have pH 3 to 4, quite acidic, actually. It's a little on the acidic side, um, which is interesting. Melting point, some, some of the, the, the data is just absolutely not available. So... Um, and you say, why don't they put explosive properties and oxidizing properties? These, ca these companies aren't going to go out on a limb and say, you know, ferrous sulfate is not explosive because they don't know what the people using it are doing with it. So they just say no data available. And it's probably true. They, haven't pro they probably haven't looked at that for good reason. Um, a lot of these are no data available for interaction, acute toxicity. I told you there's chronic and acute. There's acute that happens to you immediately when you come in contact with something that's dangerous. It's going to affect you right now. Chronic is coming into contact with these compounds that are later going to get into your organs and bones and cause cancer and, and all kinds of different things. And these are, these are real things. I'm going to get, jump over. You get the idea on that. I'm going to jump over and do uh, 
an SDS on a really harsh one. And this time I'm going to use uh, uh, the name and you'll see it here as I pull up. I'm going to leave that other sheet up. So, uh -huh. so and I'd probably prefer to use the CAS number. I'm just going to check the CAS number. You'd think I'd have these numbers memorized after 20 years of doing this. I don't. That's not something I have room in my head for. <laughs> so 151, 50, 80. 151, 50, 80. Any of these are good. So if I pull you in here, we're going to just pull up uh, Fisher. I'm going to make sure you guys can see this. Hey, look at that. Close these first sulfate ones down. And go into this one. Right off the bat, we're going to do ferrous or potassium cyanide, so I can show you a couple of things here. Share this screen. So this is this is a different sheet from from uh, um, a different company, and we'll just look at see how they handle fer or uh, potassium cyanide. See if we can scare you a little bit. Thermo Fisher, can you guys see that? Yes, you can. Good. So here we go. CAS number, just check that. And if you have my book, you can reference it again. Chapter four, all of them are laid out alphabetical. You know that you're in the right area. If you have, you know you're in the right compound or chemical when you have the CAS number. So acros organic. So let's go down here. See, now here, Thermo Fisher is doing it by category, one through four. One being the most severe and four being the least severe. So right off the bat, Acute oral toxicity, uh, acute dermal toxicity, inhalation, dust and mist, all category one. Heart, cardiovascular, all category one. And I'm not trying to turn you off from using KCN. I'm trying to turn you on to knowledge for risk management. If you, if you in fact, want to use some of these compounds, you'll know what you're using and what you need to watch out for. Um, all of this should be pretty straightforward, right? I mean, if you're dealing with potassium cyanide, I'm just using this as an example. So you see what they're talking about and what you already know, whether it's, uh, you know, true or not. Um, it's, uh, it's good to come through here. So they have um, first aid remedy, but you saw just before that that you have to call a poison control center. I'll tell you one thing that I've done in the past um, and that I'll do again up here is that once I'm set up, I'll usually call the fire department, poison control, uh, even police maybe sometimes, but definitely e EMS, emergency medical services, and uh, poison control, ambulances, those kinds of things. And I'll take them around in my studio. I'll show them the compounds I work with, those kinds of things. And why, why do I do that? I do that in case I have an accident. So the fire department isn't rolling in here not knowing what they're dealing with, with ether or collodion. Poison control knows that I've been exposed to X chemical and they know what to do if I'm not conscious or, you know, God forbid any of that stuff happens. But what I'm saying is safety first and understanding the compounds you're dealing with. And you don't have to be handling KCN to have dangerous situations. A lot of these compounds are subtly dangerous, especially in the right environments, like I just mentioned silver nitrate earlier, although silver nitrate is very corrosive and quite dangerous, especially, you know, to your eyes and things like that. So um, go through, look at every compound that you're using, look at what you need to do to mitigate those and or say, I don't want anything to do with it, right? And you're, you're welcome. Um, in fact, I encourage you um, to not deal with compounds you're not comfortable with. If you don't want an additional ether, if you don't want cyanide, if you don't want cadmium bromide, those kinds of things, just don't deal with it. Um, look at the LDL oral and the LDL dermal. Uh, the dermal is, you know, quite, uh, quite, you know, 22 Point three microgram per kilogram. I mean, that's uh, you. You probably need a lot, but look at the oral. I mean, that you know, rat and rabbit testing. 
Uh, they didn't do it on humans. And then the inhalation. And that's really, I mean, 0.16 milligram per liter. They're probably, that is, that's probably the most volatile, right? You're, you're probably not going to survive in uh, taking that stuff into your body. So just as an idea, that's one. Um, let's jump over here and look at, uh, look at another one. I want to just take this out of the sheet, just show you some things here. Um, of course, you can do this on your own easily. Just click on that link and start typing in either names or, again, I prefer the uh, um, CAS number. But I, I know the names of the compounds, so I can usually get there. So, yeah, here we, here we have, again, I just did a search on cadmium bromide. Again, another great example of make sure you know what your CAS number is, right? Look at that. There are different CAS numbers here. Well, this is bromate hydrate. But um, usually, usually the one most prevalent, but don't guess. I mean, you just look up the CAS number and know that you're using the right one because it is easy to get. I've had people email me before and say, I just looked this up and look at this. I didn't know I was handling this. And I write them back. Uh, no, you got the wrong uh, compound in there. Use the CAS number. We're looking for 77, 89, 42, 6. And any of these are great. We'll go back to Acro, Acros there and look at their sheet. And let me get you back in here, view S SDS. And let's take a look at this one. Stop um, and get PDF. Man, I, StreamYard should handle that a little better. I don't know why I have to jump through that hoop every time, but. There we are. Again, a different brand up here. Doesn't matter. This is cadmium bromide. Another big one that always comes up in um, conversation about how I, I believe actually this is the most dangerous compound in the process, but that's just my opinion. There's the CAS number, 7789426. That is correct. Um, so right off the bat, we have skin contact, inhalation, and ingestion. So it tells you right there what to do. Um, flashpoint upper lower doesn't have any data on that. Um, it should have spillage handling where protective equipment ensure adequate ventilation. Do not get nice. Keep containers tightly closed. Well ventilated space. Again, pretty much all the same um, kind of data that that you'd you'd expect from something like that, right? Um, Oh, look at that. Look at that. They don't even have the carcinogenic uh, A1 known human carcinogen. Okay. A2 suspected carcinog carcinogen. Uh, it does. It. I don't think it's su suspected at all. This is a very uh, carcinogenic compound. It will um, get in your bones. And this is a chronic thing. Uh, organs and bones over time, if you have exposure to it. Um, you're going to uh, probably have some problems. Um, you you read Frederick Scott Archer's death certificate. Uh, I've talked about this before. He died in 1857, May 1st, 1857. Didn't find a, a birth date on him. But when we put that placard on his grave in, in London, um, we just said 1813 to 1857. And we said... Uh, that that Archer Day, the the wet plate day, would be the first weekend in May. Kind of his death date, but that's all we had to go off of. Anyway, if you look at his death certificate, it will say it says that he died from liver complications, meaning that he had severe liver problems. And if we jump into ether right here, you can look at um, that data sheet on ether exposure and liver damage, and it's 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 serious. And you, so you don't want to be Huff and ether, your liver is going to, if you think, um, let's look at a different sheet on here. If you think um, alcohol is hard in your liver, try ether. No, don't try ether. Just, uh, just know that uh, ether is terrible for your liver. Let's, uh, let's pull it up. Um, I like to use anhydrous ether. What is anhydrous ether? Anhydrous ether is ether without water in it. I try to manage my water content. This is no results were found. So you know what I do? If I run into that, if I type a name in, I go right over and grab my CAS number. 
And I'd probably just recommend using CES numbers. And, and then that way you avoid any confusion or any uh, problems with getting the right data back. Let's see if they'll give me one here. There we go. Uh, there we go. Diethyl ether. Uh, 29.7. Yeah, they're all 29.7. So let me share this one. And we'll look at this ether content here. Data sheet share. So all of these are 60, 29, 7, which are right. Let's go to the Fisher one, diethyl ether. Oh, it's probably going to, man, we have to click through. Here's, here's what they do. They give you this sheet right in front of the actual MS, SDS. I always call them MSDS, right before the actual data layout. So they give you kind of an abstract, extremely flammable liquid and vapor, harmfully swallowed. Um, maybe harmful is swallowed and enters airways, damage to organs through prolonged or repeated exposure, excessive drowsiness, respiration, um, courts keep it away from flames, keep cool. So you can get, if you just want kind of the lay versions of the data, it's right there. Um, acute toxicity, oral, aspiration hazard, final liquid, specific target organ toxicity, meaning that's what they're referring to right there is liver damage right there. So um, danger right right on the top. They they tell you that that's uh, that's bad news. So they usually give you the. Huh, they didn't give me a. Hold on. Let me see if I can get it. Uh, and they usually gave me a, a sheet to jump over to from that. Look at the SDS sheet, but they're not doing that. Let's find a different company real quick. See, um, Sigma is good. I like Sigma. If, if I have my choice of Sigma, I'll get Sigma. I'll put that up there. So there's View SDS. I'm going to have to change over here again. Uh, Diethyl Ether. StreamYard. Let's look at this Ether tab. I think that's it. Yeah. So there's diethyl ether. <clears throat> and I use anhydrous diethyl ether, but that's irrelevant. Um, let's see if we can go down here. Let's see if we can. We actually search and let's see if we have anything. <gasps> Look at that. I just searched liver. Yeah. So they call out specifically liver damage in there. These are the things you have to look for. You have to. How, how does it affect me? What are my risks? Inhaling, touching it, what kind of inhalation? There's a LB50, oral rat. Uh, that's, yeah, that's quite high. Uh, 260 milligrams a kilo. So some of the research, we know, we don't need to dig down into the weeds to know that this is uh, highly, highly flammable. It's heavier than oxygen, so it goes down to the ground. So if you have a furnace or a water heater or something with a little pilot light burning, that ignition source, if you were enclosed in, you could have some problems there for sure. Um, look at 10.2 right here on stability and reactivity. Stable under recommended storage conditions. We'll talk about that. Test for peroxide formation before distillation or evaporation. So, and then it says test for uh, formation or discard after one year, stable under recommended conditions. So we've talked about, and if you have my book, I write about these um, peroxide formations, very unstable. Once ether is, is oxidized or exposed to oxygen, once you open a bottle up, you have oxygen in there. Over time, and it does take a long time, but over time you can form peroxides and peroxides you can just touch and the whole thing will blow up, kind of like silver fulm fulminate. Silver fulminate is even more explosive, far more, well, more explosive than peroxides. But these are the things you want to pay close attention to when you're looking at these compounds. And they give all the data in here about vapor, boiling range, um, odor, sweet, ether-like. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, old Gonzo, right? Um, <clears throat> the uh, Gonzo, the uh, fear and loathing in Las Vegas. He said the perfect drug for Las Vegas is ether. There's a lot of people that like to get high on this stuff. Their liver probably won't last too long, but they uh, they do like the high off of it. 
all those medical doctors in the in the teens and 20s, 1910 teens and 20s here in this country, a lot of them would walk around with a rag in their pocket soaked in ether and they just take hits off of all day. Kind of kind of like a kind of like a downer, I guess it would be. I'm not into that stuff, so I don't know, but that's what I assume. Anyway, you get the idea here. So let's uh that's that's the material data safety sheets. You guys can go to that link, look any of them up, read them. And uh, and take appropriate precautions. I'm just going to talk about a few of them right here, the ones that we really use a lot. Thank you, Pablo. It is chemical abstract service. Thank you. I thought it was something like that. Having the revision dates is important too. You're right, Jeffrey. Yeah, you always want to make sure science changes. Right? It's not like people with opinions; they just hold on to them, and never change. Science evolves and they learn more and they change. So you've got to have that data in there to, to know. Hey, Thilo, good to see you, brother. I haven't seen you for a little bit. Um, good to see you, though. See if we can pop some more people in here. Can I scroll down there? I don't know. Yeah, I think I can. There's Doug. There's Hank. Hey, good to see you guys. Okay, we got we got a couple more people. I like to fill it up if I can. People like to be involved in this stuff. So, oh, Drew and Christina, hello, Drew and Christina, Pleasant Valley, PA. Good to see you guys, too. Thank you for jumping in here. Dale says the reason for the SDS as opposed to MSDS is international compatibility. I researched this a while back, and I seem to recall it was agreed by the signatories of the United Nations came into Yeah, something like that. Um, so it doesn't matter if you call them, you know, late for dinner or early for lunch, as long as you have that data, that's the most important thing. And people, you know, here's the kind of the sheep, sheeple mentality of this. Um, they're either, they don't feel like they're equipped to be able to search about chemicals and hit a database and learn about what they're dealing with. So they go onto a social media account or a forum board that's not, you know, kind of up to par and they just read what people write. And man, I, I tell you, and everybody can see this, you see some dangerous stuff online. I swear to God, my attorney for liability would be like, I mean, they'd be screaming at me if I, here's the thing, when you publish information about stuff like this, and you're telling people to handle nitrocellulose and ether and KCN and, and all kinds of these compounds, and you're an expert on these processes, if something happens in America, anyway. I don't know about the rest of the world. Your country may vary. But in America, if something happens to Billy or Sue or somebody out here that's working that, and they go in there, they blow their house up, and they kill their neighbors and their dogs, and they find my book laying there, they're going to have some questions for me. They're going to call me in. I could be held somewhat liable for those kinds of things. So, when you put that stuff out, especially for lawsuits, and Americans are very litigious, they love to sue people. So when you put that information out and you say, here's what to do, I'm an expert on this, you are taking responsibility to some degree for their safety. So you guys that are making YouTube videos and just kind of regurgitating stuff that you've heard or you're not kind of doing your due diligence and it's fancy and fun and you get the clicks and all that, just, you know, forewarned is forearmed. Somebody gets hurt in this process and they've got your literature, your information, or their attorney finds that, and especially in America, you're going to be um, coming in for a little bit of questioning and possibly be called into court. I don't know. So be careful. There's nothing wrong with disseminating information and giving information out if it's correct and if you've done your research on it. Just to say, repeat something you saw somewhere online, uh, and I see that all the time, all the time. I mean, almost every day, if I have to get on and make an ad for this show or do do something, I see two or three posts that I'm just like scratching my head about, wondering what are these people doing. So, forewarned is forearmed. Um, can I add something? Yes, if you can add Hello, Doug. Good to see you, brother. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just grabbed one of the chemicals out of my lab, wherever it is. Cool. And let me, um, let me see if I can blow it up. It's ammonium dichromate. But the bottom line is it does have the uh, CAS on it. Cool. I'm going to blow up a picture of me. Um, 
But I would suggest, and I've dealt with chemo. I've been with BA, some of the largest chemical companies. Yes, you have. I'm not a, um, get a notebook. Take the time to um, make a notebook. Make it red. Put big SDS numbers on it. Keep it close to the front of your door because I know in your area, your emergency people are not going to be well qualified or knowledgeable of a lot of this stuff, rather like a big city or whatever. Have most of them there. aren't, though, Doug. Even in the big cities, most of them aren't. And you bring up a great point. These are obscure chemicals that we're using in this product. This isn't bleach and Clorox and rat poison, right? These are obscure, like you're saying. That's a good point. And have and put the, you know, some of them have product names, some may not, but have that name on there and just. And if, if you run into a problem, a kid gets into your lab, you know something, even if you're going to take them to the hospital, grab that SDS sheet. So you Very don't good have point. to the computer or go through, well, maybe this um, SNF or BASF or Dow make little different versions. You've got that chemical uh, yep. description. So yeah, Very, I, I, very good point. And if that's you have a commercial important. lab, that's you important. have to have it. Yeah. And that's what I was mentioning earlier. I don't know if you were in when I said that, but. Um, in my former studios, I didn't do this in Europe, but in my former studios in America, I've always contacted both EMS, fire department, poison control. Not, not for anyone's safety other than mine, my neighbors, my pets, my family, those, those types of things. And that's a very good point, Doug. That, and you're not trying to advertise. And, and if you, you worry about, oh, I'm ha handling hazard chemicals and I might get in trouble for it. Well, that's another bridge that you have to cross and deal with if you are, right? I mean, I'm not this, you know, everything up and up. You know, I'm not this straight marcher and I, I'm reasonable and I'm rational, right? But when you're dealing with these compounds, explosive, toxic, uh, super dangerous, some of these are. And the way some people throw them around out there, I just, I am, to be honest with you, I'm completely amazed that somebody hasn't been injured or killed in this process to this point. And the more people we bring on board, the more that kind of gossip and misinformation and disinformation spreads, um, the more chances we're gonna raise this up. So I know this isn't the funnest, the most fun YouTube or Studio Q show to do, but it's probably one of the most important things to throw that thought in people's heads. So I, the last thing I wanna see is somebody get hurt or especially killed, or even their pets their neighbors, anybody that's around you is going to be subject to the way you handle these compounds. So thank you for sharing that, Doug. That is absolutely important. Um, so let's let's talk about now. You've got the SDS search. You, you can go in there and do that. You've got the CAS numbers. You've got all that stuff. So you can do your own homework on this. Let's talk about, let's just quickly go through what we use. Calcium carbonate. Let's say we're cleaning glass plates. First thing you have is calcium carbonate, some grain alcohol, and some water to clean the plate. The only real compound in there we're concerned with is the Everclear alcohol, right? Um, and especially if you're using a denatured, a denaturant in the alcohol, something that smells really bad, like methyl ethyl ketone, or something they've denatured that alcohol with to keep you from drinking it, those fumes can be super toxic. Uh, go to the SDS search and do methyl ethyl ketone and look up MEK. That's, that's a very common denaturate in alcohol. So even the fumes from that kind of stuff can be harmful, even in cleaning, right? Calcium carbonate is not going to hurt you. Distilled water is not going to hurt you. But, and Everclear really won't hurt you other than it is flammable, it catches on fire and all that stuff. So we've cleaned our plate. Now we pour the collodion on the plate. What do we have there? We have nitrocellulose ether and alcohol. So when you buy plain USP collodion anywhere in the world, the total assay is going to be 70% plus ether, 22% alcohol, and 4 to 8% nitrocellulose. We all know those two solvents are extremely flammable. One of them can cause organ damage and nitrocellulose, you know, obviously is super explosive. We don't have to go into details about that. I always mention this. Has anybody seen that movie, Inglorious Bastards? It's a great, great film. If you haven't seen it, watch it. Um, I won't give away the ending, but the ending has something to do with nitrocellulose. Um, so it's a very, uh, 
it's a very good um, explanation of what nitrocellulose can do. So I don't think we have to go into any long explanation about uh, the dangers of explosion and fire and those hazards. But here again, now we have another compound in there, ether. If you have a denaturant in your alcohol, you're dealing with a vapor exposure, even cleaning plates. Now you're dealing with vapor exposure with ether. Even if you don't add additional ether, guys, I'm not talking about having the bottle of ether that you add more ether to. Already 70 some percent in your collodion. So you're already out on the limb with the ether. Um, pour your plate, silver nitrate, drop your plate in the silver nitrate. Silver nitrate, very, very corrosive, uh, very, very dangerous to if you got it in your eyes, uh, you've heard all those kinds of things. Um, and I, I would emphasize, because I see so many people doing this now, heating or boiling your silver bath after it's been used is not a good idea. Silver fulminate. Go to the SDS search and search silver fulminate. Look how it's made. Look, look at what's the handling, those kinds of things. Well, I don't have sun. I'm at 48 degrees. Hey, you know what? Wait for sun, right? I mean, this isn't, this isn't the end of the world if we can't make a plate, if we have to wait a little while, right? So be very cognizant, very aware of the, the compounds you're handling, what you're doing with them, how you're storing them. Uh, you're heating them up. You're mixing them with something, right? Be very, very cautious of that kind of stuff. Uh, so after the silver nitrate, we pour, we make the exposure, we pour developer. Let's talk about, we just talked about ferrous sulfate. You have um, glacial acidic acid. You can look at that. That's a skin irritant. Again, not really good to inhale. It can irritate your, your trachea, your, your breathing apparatus in your body. Um, it can do damage that way. It can burn it up pretty good. I don't know if you've ever got glacial acidic acid on your skin. Not a pleasant experience. Um, it burns it up. You feel that. It is very, uh, very owie, ouchy. So, um, but again, inhalation. You see this pattern now? All about inhalation, ventilation, storing them properly, right? We didn't even talk about the collodion having cadmium bromide or salts in it, iodides and bromides in it. Google, uh, SDS search your salts, the salts you use. What does emodium bromide do? What does cadmium iodide do? What does potassium iodide? How, how is all that managed? Learn those things. Have them, have them in your head. The ones you use, know what you're doing with. Um, so you've got the developer, water, alcohol, eth, uh, glacial acidic acid, and iron in it. It's pretty, uh, pretty safe. Um, you just need to uh, understand that, you, again, you have those inhalation issues, especially if you're using denatured alcohol. And then it, uh, then we go to fix, right? KCN, we know sodium thiosulfate is pretty innocuous, but look it up. Look up ammonium thiosulfate and sodium thiosulfate. Look them up. Do, do your due diligence and see what you need to mitigate to you even use those. Um, and then at the end, we have the varnish. And we go back to more of a solvent-based problem with the alcohol and the varnish. Uh, whether you use shellac or gum sandrac, those are innocuous. Those are just uh, bug poop and tree sap. So um, you won't have any problem there. And the lavender oil is a plasticizer. There are a whole bunch of ancillary compounds, right? For me, I can immediately throw in pyrogalic acid, immediately throw in um, iodine, immediately throw in, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, dichromates, right? Doug just held up a bottle of dichromate. SDS dichromates. Take that CAS number and put it in the database and see what you get. Dichromates are absolute. They're just like cadmium bromide. They're just like any of these other compounds. Now, when it comes to storing them, we all know handling. The PPE, everybody knows this because of COVID now, right? Personal protective equipment, PPE, gloves, uh, respirator or some kind of some kind of particle mask something to keep uh depending on what you're handling i'm saying those in broad terms right um something to keep you from ingesting massive amounts of these compounds uh, vapor wise if your place is set up correctly with ventilation and proper ventilation and moving the air around you can mitigate a lot of these issues just with that if it's big enough and you're moving enough air you don't have to mask up. If you're where, if you're in a tiny space, 
You don't have any air circulation. Definitely mask up. In a perfect world, if I could, if if somebody waved a wand and said you can make any wish you want on this topic, I would wish that everyone had a fume hood with an attached ventilation motor that they could get under the fume hood and just mix the stuff up. Let it be, just pull all the vapor away, pull all that stuff away and be done with it. And you have to do that if you're doing like mercury daguerreotypes and things like that, that you just, there's no way to get around that. Yes, you're right, Jeffrey. PPE is definitely, especially gloves, eye protection, stuff that you're, I always have cuts on my hands, you know, I always have little nicks or this or that. And your eyes are just kind of hanging out there. So, and you're you're breathing air. So, be it be very aware of. Wow, that is strong. If you do that kind of stuff, your environment isn't correct. You're not suited up properly. You're not handling these things properly. Be very aware of your own body's response to these uh, compounds. I'll tell you how. Uh, I'll give you a quick story. This is. I've told this before. I've got 100 or 200 videos up here or something like that. So I'm sure I've mentioned it in one of them. Years ago, I think it was, two. It was, I don't think, it was 2006. I had just, well, I was just coming to the end of the uh, uh, Madison, uh, Portraits from Madison Avenue project that I did in the early 2000s. And uh, a wonderful lady named Ruth Lubbards at Art Access Gallery got a hold of me and she said, Quinn, I understand you're doing a project and an old process and you've got interesting content. We'd love to show it, show your, have you come down here to the gallery and show your work. So they gave me the entire gallery, a great big front gallery and the back gallery. And I set up a little demo area in the back. I had all my plates in the front, had a great, this is March of 2006, had a great reception. People really, I was amazed at how many people were interested in seeing that stuff. And anyway, she, Ruth said, could you do a live demonstration for the people? And it was a packed house. I think we had it on a Saturday. I said, sure. So I set up all in the front. I did a portrait of one of the people there. Ruth was way in the back. There must have been 50 or 60 people there. Ruth was way in the back of the front gallery. And I got the cyanide out. And I was talking about it. And I poured the cyanide. I use a tray. I don't use a, a dipper tank. I just use a tray. I pour the cyanide out in the tray, just just a little bit, a couple of centimeters deep, just to throw a plate in. And I put the plate in, and I'm 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 you know counting it off, clearing it. And uh, it was I didn't have the cyanide out, but maybe three or four minutes, and I poured it right back into the jug, sealed it up. And I later learned that Ruth, the the woman that owned the gallery, was way in the back. I uh, I don't know, thirty meters away, forty meters away way in the back of the room, she said about a minute after I opened that cyanide, she came down with a migraine headache that put her in bed for two days. I mean, that is, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about your own genetic makeup and your response to these compounds. You really have to pay attention to that stuff. And you really have to pay attention working indoors with people. We don't have to do that much anymore now with the virus. But it will come back, you know, in a year or so, we'll be back gathering up in tiny rooms, teaching these processes. We won't be worried about a coronavirus, but I would be worried about strangers' exposure to some of these compounds. A lot of times, um, all my demos I try to do out of doors, like all the colleges and unis I go to or used to go to, all that stuff's over now, right? Um, I, I used to go and they were always outdoors. Rarely did I do anything inside. And if I did anything inside, I said, cr- I'll say, crank up your ventilation. Crank that thing like crazy, right? Move all this air out of here. Um, and, and Carson says, how much air ventilation do you recommend? I recommend between 400 and 800 um, feet, cubic feet per minute. A big system. Pull it out. Pull it out. Refresh that air. And have an outside intake. You can't just recycle this stuff. You need to pull it in and refresh that air. You can't just fake it and say I'm running it through a little, uh, you know, <clears throat> allergen filter or something. It doesn't work that way. You need to you need to replace that air, exhaust the old stuff, and bring in new stuff. That's what ventilation is, right? So, so I say be- my my uh, the place I just left up north here in Denver. I had a, well, I had a big studio in Denver for a few years, and then I moved out east. And in my house in the suburbs of Denver in Aurora, 
my downstairs was my entire studio and I had my dark room uh, uh, built out or blocked off. And in that dark room, I moved 460 feet of air out of the or cubic feet per minute out of the dark room into the open space. You could pour a plate, uh, do the whole thing outside, and then go in the dark room and drop it in the silver bath. And that that smell of ether, because that's what you smell with collodion, right? That smell of ether would dissipate within a minute or two. People never got sick. I had hundreds of people through there, never had any issues or any problems, most likely due to that extreme ventilation system. And I always worried and I always wondered, am I going to get somebody genetically that's just not, you know, Ruth's story has stuck with me forever. I mean, that just bothered me to no end that this wonderful woman is standing way back in the room. And I have a bottle of KCN open for a couple of minutes up front and she's down for two days with a blackout migraine. I mean, <clears throat> so everybody's going to react a little different and you have to, it's not just about drinking or sticking your fingers in this stuff, just standing there innocent and, and getting sick from stuff. So it's not always just about you. It's about the other people around you, uh, and even more importantly, sometimes. So those are, <clears throat> those are kind of some of the things on handling. Now, storage, we say this nonstop, store in a dark, cool, ventilated place. We say that over and over and over again. Why the dark? Um, light has energy. UV has energy. It will decompose compounds, break them down, and change them. Cool. Heat has the same principle or properties. So if you leave your NH4I out in, in the light and the air, expose that. It'll turn yellow. It changes. We, we talked about some of those kinds of things. And ventilation. <clears throat> Why do we talk about ventilation? Because, God forbid, you had a little leak on an ether bottle or something, and you built up a big combustible bomb in your dark room or in your storage area, right? You can't have it sealed. You need to move air through just for, you will smell ether everywhere. If you have a tiny, tiny leak of ether, you'll smell it everywhere. And I mean, a, a cat pop off a collodion bottle, you'll fumigate the whole thing. So keep these things in mind as you're handling. And before you ever handle, I, I say take a moratorium on making plates. If you don't feel comfortable, Hand, handling the compounds, go do the research yourself and find out what you're comfortable with. You know, when people tell me, Quinn, I don't want to deal with additional ether. I, for whatever reason, right? They may not even know about peroxides or liver damage or whatever, or they may. Um, I say, no problem. Don't do it. Use, use all alcohol, right? S uh, substitute that for alcohol. They don't want to use cadmium bromide. No problem. Use, use ammonium. Use, there's plenty of bromides you can use. Use you know, whatever you want to do, if you if you're not comfortable, comfortable with handling these compounds, don't do it because you're almost assured to have an accident or get worried or create something. I can't tell you how many emails that I've had where people send me a snapshot of a very precarious situation. Uh, are these fulminites in the bottom of my I just heated my silver bath. Are those little balls fulminite? Uh um, I just spilled this and show me a photograph of something spilled on a concrete floor, a kitchen floor. What's going to happen? You know, and I'm like, God, I, I don't know. I'm not there. You know, I mean, that's why these SDS sheets tell you how to clean up spills, what you need to do, or if you need to call somebody, right? Those things are really, really important. And we never talk about them because they're unpleasant. Who wants to talk about all the bummer stuff? The good stuff is that we stay safe and healthy. We can continue to make pictures. We can continue to make plates and we'll do it safely, not only for you, but your neighbors, your family, your pets and everybody around you. So I hope, I hope um, people will heed a little bit of that information and, and suit up if you need, if you don't have ventilation. Make sure you know your environment. Make sure your your storage can, your storage vessels are solid. Make sure you have a proper place to store this. Don't put it out in your garage in the summertime. You know, don't put it. Uh, uh, you know, don't just leave stuff laying out for your dog. Or I think Doug just mentioned uh, your kid coming by and what's this? You know, I mean, not that people are going to eat it or mess with it, but you just never know. Your animals can lap this stuff up and die from it. I mean. Again, I said this a million times. Go read, go read um, Jay, um, Jay, um, Jay's dark room, dangers in the dark room. We'll post that up again. Just, I mean, this—it's 
it's anecdotal to some degree. I mean, they're documented cases of what, what happened in the 19th century with photographers, but it'll give you some idea of the lack of knowledge they had about the compounds and how they were handling them uh, that led to death or injury or destruction, you know, tons of tons of places burned down. I mean, obviously they had open wood burning stoves and they're dealing with ether and, and stuff, you know, and alcohol. I mean, obviously they're going to have those kinds of problems. So. Quinn, can Let's I have a but yes, please. Yeah, I've, and you've kind of said it, but it's getting real nitpicky. But also, wherever you store it, try to determine what needs to be stored together. I mean, the worst case is KCN and your your acids. Um, the other and the volatiles, if you can get it in a metal cabinet, because everything can be stable and it can't fall from that shelf. But I was raised in California country and earthquakes and. And you can't imagine how things can migrate all over your lab. Um, the worst, thing, always plan on the worst thing. And, and again, like I said, keep your liquids maybe separated from your, your dries and keep your, your, um, your uh, acids away from some of the volatile like KCN or you will really be in trouble. Great, great, great advice. I totally concur 100% with that. And the reason Doug mentions... Uh, separating them out and that's actually what i do i have shelves for my dry um and you know everybody's a little different so i don't i'm not saying to do this if you don't want to do this you can figure it out yourself but um i'm with doug on this i have all my dry material separated from my liquid material and i store them in different areas and he's talking about for instance if you do use kcn and you have glacial acidic acid I mean, right off the bat, one's dry and one's liquid. So I would never have them together. But it, but he's talking about KCN and, and glacial acidic acid. And I think we all know what happens when if we were ever to mix those two things together, we would form hydrogen cyanide gas. And, and we all know what hydrogen cyanide gas does, right? It kills you. So those kinds of things, will the SDS, that data, uh, that, that information will tell you those kinds of things. And if it doesn't, we have literature out today that definitely will um, inform you about those obvious kinds of things. I, uh, I saw a video um, a few years ago. I don't know if it's still up. I don't even want to say who it was, but I saw a workshop and people were sticking their bare hands into trays of cyanide and pulling plates up. You know, I don't even care if it's a 2% mixture, just... You know, you can, you know, Darwin will have his day, but I don't want that to affect the rest of the community because there's a lot of great folks, a lot of great people working in this process today. Really good folks. And they're, they're, they want, they don't want any harm. They don't want any bad stuff to come down. This whole community would suffer if somebody gets hurt like that. That would throw a big, well, the idiom in English we say that it throw a big wet blanket over everything, but basically bum everybody out. It would scare people away. Um, you don't have to be scared about this stuff, right? You just have to be responsible, just like you're driving, right? Just like anything you take where other people are involved that you could hurt yourself or other people with whatever you're doing. It's just about you know safety first, using your precautions, using your head, and having the knowledge. This is this is the one thing I wanted to say today. If I don't get anything else across, is get the knowledge. Don't rely on Joe Schmo YouTube or Quinn Jacobson YouTube. Go out and get that knowledge yourself. Right? Compare compare literature and data. I wouldn't use the 19th century stuff so much as far as safety goes, but the, the more scientific stuff and the people that make the compounds and the scientists that research this stuff, look at what they say about handling. And I know I've had this complaint before. They're extreme. They go way overboard on that data sheet. Well, they, they probably do. In all honesty, they probably do. But I'd rather err on that side than the other side, right? So 20 years. I've been working in this and thank goodness I've never had an accident. I, I, I've shared this one time before, early, early on. This was probably 2000, maybe 2003. I was in my dark room. This is when I lived in Utah and I was in my dark room. I had a big 12 foot north facing window. I, I made all those Madison Avenue photographs with that big, beautiful north actinic light. It was gorgeous. And I had a sitter over there. I got excited. Um, 
I stuck my fingers in the cyanide to pull the plate up and, you know, cutting glass. I had cuts on my fingers. It wasn't five seconds. My head felt like it was going to explode. I started losing my vision. My vision went down like this and I turned around to go out of the dark room to have my wife call poison control or an ambulance or something. And, uh, by the time I got in the house, I had tunnel vision and I had, it felt like the top of my head was going to blow off. I'd never had a headache like that. So immediate, so acute, so, so strong. By the time I got, I opened the door to go in the house, it started dissipating. And by the time I got in the house, I, I was coming back around, but I don't share that as, as a badge of honor. That was stupid. That was ridiculous. I got excited. I didn't have my gear on. Um, uh, I never, I have never stuck my finger barehanded in cyanide again in my life, ever, 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 ever. And I'm lucky to have not had any damage from that. That was ignorance. That was excitement and ignorance. I'm a different person now, 17, some years, 18 years later, something like that. So just, I've lived some of that stuff. And uh, thank God nothing else happened. But I can imagine if you were really to get down to the bottom of this, you're going to find people out there that have gotten sick from this process. And I could tell you about two of them. I, I don't want to give their names. One tried everything, but their reaction to the ether was so bad, it, they couldn't function. And it was, it was, it was hurting them physically. Um, so that th you're going to react to things differently. So be aware that it's, that it's, if you have people around you and it's fun to demonstrate this process, right? It's really fun to do that. But be aware of their safety when you're handling these compounds and chemicals out and about and your own as well as your own too. Dale's, let's see what Dale says. Is pre-mixing the dries as a liquid concentrate solution to mitigates the airborne particles and how they're... Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, that's a great point, Dale. Um, and, I, and I talk about that. Yes, uh, and I'll, let me address that one right after this, the liquid concentration of KCN. Um, Dale's asking, wouldn't it be wise to mitigate some of these issues by mixing compounds together and knowing what you're doing to stabilize those compounds? And I'm going to give you a couple examples here. And they're in my book, of course, but um, Dale just mentioned um, the biggest risk from cadmium bromide is an aerosol, is the dust. And, and you'll notice if you do use cadmium bromide, it kind of, it's kind of moist. It's got a dampening agent in it, so it's not just a super dry powder. So it's already got a dampening agent in it. But if you want to mitigate that whole thing, make a bunch of iodizer. You do two things. You mitigate the CDBR or the cadmium bromide risk of aerosol, and you stabilize the ether for peroxides. Woohoo! So two birds, one stone, and you, you've done half the work already to, to go ahead and make your collodion, and you're safer, and you're safer, okay? Now, the liquid collodion or the liquid concentrate KCN. Um, uh, the, the problem with pre-mixing KCN, and I've done this a lot. I, I've made, you know, three liters of KCN because I don't want to be handling it and mixing it all the time. The one problem with that, Dale, is, is that you have the oxidation factor. So once you expose that KCN to oxygen, that that will affect the KCN a little bit. You won't get that peak performance. In a perfect world, you'd want to mix KCN up right before you use it. Like for workshops, I'd make two liters of KCN, right? The morning of the workshop, I'd mix that and it'll last a couple, three days and, and it's fresh and all that. So um, those kinds of things are great ideas. And, and there's a whole bunch of those that you can do. And, and a few of those I recommend in the book. And you can figure out your own way through doing your research on the chemicals, what stabilizes what? Oh, I didn't know alcohol stables ether. Well, let's mix the, the uh, iodizer up and, and have the salts mixed up and ready to go and just mix it with the collodion when we're ready. Those kinds of things are really brilliant. I don't know why that was never published before. There were just not, not enough people working in the processes, I don't think. But Chopper Carson, maybe a crazy, never a crazy question. Maybe a crazy question, but any recommendations on materials for glove? Actual chemical intended handling rubber nitrile material? Okay. Yes, that, that is not a crazy question. That's a great question, Chopper. This is I recommend don't don't use gloves. I see people with those really skinny lunch lady clear plastic big fat fingered gloves on. 
<laughs> they look like they're going to slide off at any time. They're not the best to use in these processes. Number one, that material, it's like it's like the cheapest one-ply toilet paper you can find. Not, not a whole lot of strength there, right? So forewarned. Um, so those fat, like lunch lady, they're great if you're picking up corn dogs or something, I guess, but not for chemicals in these processes. My recommendation is powder-free. Do not get gloves with powder in them. Powder-free nitro gloves. That's, that's the ones you want. Whatever color you want to use, it doesn't matter. Make sure they're not, they don't have powder in them and that they're, they're nitrile. That will protect you from absorbing anything into your skin. And another thing too, a lot of times people don't notice, but they'll have a slight cut in their glove if they've been messing with glass or something. And they get a little slight, just check your gloves. Make sure, I like to wear my gloves and I'll wipe them off with a paper towel after I get done or something. Just check them out and make sure they're still good. And so, yes, make sure that you have proper PPE glove wear on that side. What else, guys? Anything? Anything burning? Questions? That's uh, that is me for this. Uh, I know I didn't go into heavy, heavy duty detail about all of it, but I'm going to leave that up to you guys. That's that's where that's where your um, due diligence comes in, right? Because I don't know how you work. I don't know what you prefer. Everybody works a little different. They develop their own style and their 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 own kind of methodology. So you need to incorporate these safety measures into your workflow methodology. In other words, you need to take that responsibility on yourself and make sure that you have that data. You're going to be surprised, honest to God, if you sit down and you Google, not Google, if you SDS every one of the compounds that we use in the process, some of that stuff is going to surprise you. I guarantee you, if you read all of it, some of it's going to surprise you. It will. Um, and I just want people to be safe, uh, healthy, happy, have fun. I'm not here to throw, I'm not here to, to, to stand on a mountain and proclaim this is too dangerous to work in. Not at all. I think, I think you probably have, you do probably a lot. If you get in a car and drive, you're probably doing more dangerous stuff than this. But it is, it does take some time to learn the process, the chemicals, what they do, how they interact with one another, how you handle them, how you store them, all those things. You really want to pay attention to that. And I'm going to reiterate one more time what Doug reiterated and what I've reiterated a couple of times. Have those sheets available. Tell your local people what you're doing in case, God forbid, you ever had an accident or needed help. The fire department or an EMS wouldn't come in there blind and not. Why is he laying on the ground and foam coming out of his mouth? What's up? Nobody knows. Those few seconds or a couple minutes could be the difference between life and death, right? If they know you're poisoned, if you know you've got a fire hazard over here and you started a fire, the fire department won't kill themselves trying to put it out and blowing themselves up with a ether or collodion or all that. You get it. You, I, I don't need to go in there. Pablo says, not a safety question, but something I'd like to know. No problem. What's case? What's the KCN capacity? How? That is a great question. How many plates can be fixed per liter? Wonderful question. Wonderful question. Um, let me put it one, uh, two. Let me give you two different scenarios. Because we're talking safety, and this is a great segue, Pablo, um, to, to ask the pregunta, to ask this question is perfect because I mix my cyanide, and you know this, you have my book, I mix my cyanide 20 grams per one liter of distilled water. That means a 2% solution of KCN, right? I'm thinking about going to 1.5%. That means 15 grams per liter. Why would I reduce that? For mitigating safety issues. So this, the, the, the stronger the compound, the more problems you might have with it. So let's flip now and go to the 19th century and read what they used. They used solutions all the way up to 80 or 90 grams a liter. Eight or nine percent. Yeah, that stuff could get you in trouble real quick if something went wrong. But Pablo is asking, why did they do that? Or he's not asking that. I'm, I'm integrating the question. We're asking, why would they mix eight or 80 or 90 grams? They knew it was dangerous. They didn't have the full uh, information on it. But why they did that, Pablo, was because they could get 50 or 100 plates out of that liter versus 10 or 20 plates at a weaker mixture. 
So what happens here? When you have a 2% solution of KCN, and what, is K, what does Fixer do? You put that plate down in your tray or in your, your holder, and that, that fix, wh whatever it is, KCN or sodium, whatever it is, in this case, KCN, that removes all of the unexposed silver. The key word here is silver. Removes all of the unexposed silver. So could you imagine if you had a background like Hank's? Hank's got this big white background I saw in his studio. They shared this photograph of his studio the other day. And he pops his portrait off of his mannequin in the hat and the wig, right? All that back there is silver, right? All that around there is silver. That's a lot of silver that you're hogging up on the plate. But what if it's a dark background and there's still silver covering that? That has to be removed. That goes in your KCN. So a 2% solution is going to exhaust. And what do we mean by exhaust? We mean it goes from potassium cyanide, KCN, to AGCN, silver cyanide. So it gets filled up with silver. That little molecule gets replaced, and now you have silver cyanide. And so just like your regular sodium thiosulfate and film, right? We re used to kind of try to save the silver out of those fixed baths and stuff like that. It's not enough here to do that. But the bottom line is, is I get about 25 to 40, depending on what kind of exposure I'm using, whole plate, six and a half by eight, eight and a half, out of a liter of 2% silver. I could up double that content and I'd get twice as many plates. I'd get up to 80 plates maybe, right? I could go all the way up to eight or 9% and get over 100 plates out of one liter. That strength matters. That image matters. It's removing that silver. How fast does that fill up with silver? That will tell you when it's exhausted. That's when I say when I reach, if it takes 15 seconds to clear that plate in my fix and I count off another 15 for a total of 30 seconds, that fix is exhausted. Now you're going to start running into the danger of leaving unexposed silver on that plate that then you think you fixed out and you wash it and you get it out in the light and the light just hits that silver and goes black. You know, So you run the risk of exhausting your fix and then thinking you're archival and you're not. So again, in a perfect world, if you could mix up a little bit of cyanide every time you wanted to fix a plate fresh, that the most powerful the best, the most archival and all that. We, we don't live in a perfect world, but. Well, thank you, Linda. Super important talk today. I appreciate hearing that. It's absolutely part of doing what it is. That, Linda, make, that is absolutely correct. You are running a big risk working in this process, handling these, these chemicals, if you don't know about them. That's a huge risk. You, you are. And it's an important part. This is what really gets me about workshops. Great. People teach workshops. That's wonderful. Do it. But they don't spend uh, any time on safety or handling. Or what does this stuff do to me? Or what am I breathing? What am I handling? They don't spend enough time doing that. So I'm glad that uh, Linda sees that as a, a point of uh, important point. Great review of the camera. Thank you, Drew and Christine. I'm I'm so glad you like that. I you know I worry about this if anybody will even show up for these things. And oh my God, he's going to talk about this. Oh, I want to talk about something more sexy and interesting, right? No, we need to be alive to be able to do that. So that's why I want to do this. And I want you guys to you know I want you guys to have the best chance of making the best place you can and be the safest you can. And we don't want people coming down sick, you know whether it's liver disease or cancer or scorching your tubes or whatever you're doing. We don't want any of that stuff. Dale says, neutralizing KCN while adding an equal amount of chloride, chloride bleach, laundry grade, added to exhausted KCN for safety, safety safer disposal. Um, I use hydrogen peroxide. Um, uh, you, what, what he's talking about there is, if you're if you're working if you have exhausted silver cyanide and you need to get rid of it or you have some old cyanide that you can't um, dispose of or you need to dispose of you need to take that CN molecule KCN that cyanide molecule out of there and replace it with cyanate and that's what you do when you go through I have it in my book the the little recipe. Um, what you can do to neutralize. Actually, you just replace, it becomes silver cyanate. 
if you're if your bath is exhausted and you use hydrogen peroxide, you use equal amounts, and then double the water, and you can let it evaporate or dump it. It doesn't matter. So I haven't ever used bleach, but um, Clorox grade. Uh, thanks for all that info. At first, I thought it was going to be very boring, but you're right. We need to be alive to me. Thank you, C. Breslin. I appreciate that. So, guys, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate your time. Thanks for gathering with me, um, coming in. And I know it's, like I said, it's not the most sexy, but I hope people will pay a little bit of attention. And just the only thing that I would say, if you take nothing else away, get that link or, or find a good link for SDS searches. Go in, look at all your compounds that you're using, see what, what they work with, what they don't. And again, if you have any questions about any of these things, feel free to email me at wetplate at gmail.com or quinn at Studio Q. Any of those emails, you can find me. I'm happy to answer anything I can. And if I can't answer it, I'll turn it over to somebody that can or we'll get some more uh, bigger guns on it. If it's something beyond my scope and my knowledge, I'll be happy to assist. I really do want people to be safe in this. And I just, it I, I don't want to say it makes me physically sick, but it does turn me a little bit when I see people posting stuff that have no business doing what they're doing. Then they post it and other people come in and see it. And I'm just like, oh my God, how do you, you can't stop it. You know, all you can do is fight back with good information, try to give them the tools. So, and, and I'm not out trying to propagandize anybody. I'm trying to get them to learn themselves. I'm not telling you what it is. I'm telling you to learn yourselves of what you need to do. And I'm happy to assist, but um, I can't change those bad behaviors. Only knowledge and facts. If you believe in science, if you're not one of the one of the deniers today that that facts and 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 truth and things like that matter, this really does because this is your safety and your health. We want you and your family and your dog and your cat and your neighbors all to be happy and safe. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you next Saturday with a with a more uh, happier topic, let's say. <laughs> and if you want to show any work next week, send it to me. Hey, Doug, thank you, brother. You're a good man. If you want to show any work next week, send it to me at wetplate at gmail.com. If you have technical questions, any follow-ups from this, send them to me. I'm happy to address them. And thank you so much for attending. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao. Thank you. Happy weekend, Ken. Uh, thank you, Val.